All right. Well, good morning, Cross Church. How y'all doing today? Woo! Hey, I am Scott. I want to welcome you to Cross Church. Pastor Andrew is out today. I am not him, even though I borrowed his shirt again. Uh, I told him he can, he can keep the skinny jeans, though, okay? Uh, but I borrowed his shirt again. And so uh, if you were with us maybe like a month or so ago, I actually wore the same shirt. And I preached a sermon that's kind of going to be a similar topic of this. We're talking about friendship today. But if you remember back... Uh, Paul was reflecting on some people that he had been through some things with. So I want to ask you maybe to bring those people to the front of your mind again. It could be your spouse, your coworker. Ultimately, we call them friend first, right? A lot of times we have friends. And if, I know it's, and it's awesome, too. We got the young people in here. Man, God's timing is so good, isn't it? We got the young people in here. We're talking about friendship. And a lot of us that have kids... We know what they missed over the past year and a half or so, right? Like they couldn't go hang out with their friends and we wanted to get them out of our house, but it was hard, right? And they let me go play in the road and look at your friends from across the street or something or whatever it was we had set up. So young people in here today, we got a bingo card for you. If you haven't gotten one, grab one in the back. And what do we do when we hit bingo? Yell bingo, right? So if you yell bingo, if you get bingo, and you sh just feel free to shout it out. But let me give you a warning, and Pastor Andrew said this to me. He said, if anybody shouts out a false bingo, has to stay after and clean the church. Yeah, yeah right? Nothing like child labor. I told Andrew, I was like, I don't know, dude, I'm going to look this up. It's just legal ramifications here. So anyway, so if you're young in here today, I want you to think about somebody maybe you call best friend or good friend or somebody you've been longing to hang out with that you missed, uh, you know, through the year or so, you haven't really been able to be with those people. I know we kept my kids home, and I know a lot of kids went to school. So, um, so it's said, and, tell, and, and I'm sure some of you heard this, we are the sum of our closest friends, of the people that we keep in our circle, meaning that we tend to take on the personality traits, or we aspire to be like that person, or maybe that person has influence on us, or we influence that person. We have those, we take on the, the similar similarities of the people that we keep close to us, right? Can, all, can we all agree with that? Yeah, right, and we, and, and we tend to seek people, yeah, that we want to kind of have that with. Um, you know, I can say it's somebody who's been in a lot of different circles, and I could say I admit it all day, I was in some pretty bad circles, that yes, you can tend to pick up bad habits or do bad things or, you know, maybe guilty by association from hanging out with that crew. Kids, take notes here. Uh, right that you you know you're hanging out with the wrong crowd and you get in trouble and you're like I didn't do that they did that and like well that's how it works right and so uh, yeah so <laughs> I, I definitely started to take on some of those personality traits um, but I want to give the definition of friend and I like this it says a person whom one knows likes and trusts or a person with whom one is allied in a struggle or cause that's good I like this one though this one was really good this just struck me it says, a person attached to another by feelings or personal regard. Personal regard. And I found this quote. This, is, this, this really hit home with me. It says, I believe we should have friends that we look upon with personal regard. Right? Amen to that. They should be people that will lift you up, have qualities that are admirable, and that we seek to be like, and have a mutual offering at the table of friendship, which seeks to build up each other through challenges. How many of y'all got that friend that's like, come on, stop asking me to go work out? So I'm, I'm that friend. <laughs> yeah, like, come on, man, let's get up at 530 and go work out. I'm still bugging Matt. To come. Anyways, so, uh, and, and somebody who uh, we could provide an environment which can be completely open and truthful even in hard times. Yeah, we got those friends that'll be there and will tell us, right? We, we, a lot of us, we don't recognize, and it's interesting, I was in a meeting actually earlier this week, they were talking about blind spots. We all have these blind spots that we don't recognize in ourselves, but the people in our circle, they recognize in them all day long, and they're trying to tell you in a nice, friendly way, but you're just not getting it sometimes. Am I right? Like, you're just like, ah, you're being stubborn. I don't want to, I'm not trying to hear that. You're not being my friend. <laughs> yeah, like... As maybe they are being your friend. But one thing I know, and I want to kind of lay a little groundwork here, is that misery loves company. Am I right? And so we're in a bad situation. We try to bring those, bad, those people down with us instead of letting them lift us up. Look, I'm, I'm in here uh, on Wednesdays. I, I, Dave lets me lead with him and, and celebrate recovery. And we try to lift people up because we know people are going through some things, especially coming to those meetings. And, and some of them, you start to hear their stories. You're like, man, you know, you're not going to pull me down in there. Like, let's, let's help us. Like, we're going to lift you up out of there. We're going to go through that together. So I, I just want to give that warning that misery loves company. But man, 
And so looking at friendship and this whole idea of friendship, the Bible gives us the perfect definition. It gives us an outline. And I know this list that I'm about to go through isn't going to be exhaustive. It's not everything, but it's definitely a good foundation. And, and so if you have a Bible, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians. Make sure I say that right because I always say Philippines. And people are like, dude, you said Philippines the whole time. It's Philippians. So if I say it really fast, Philippines, it's just my North Ohio accent. I'm sorry. Um, but we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 19. And I believe that this particular section is traits of God-sent companions. So I'm going to read it. And hopefully you're there. I don't hear any pages being turned. Kids, I know you guys. We make you open the Bible. Uh, so starting at verse 19, it says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven character that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will be coming shortly. I love Paul's hope that he can get back and out of this situation, out of prison. Remember, he's writing this from prison, and he wants to get back to doing the things, wants to get back to the people and being amongst the people. So f the first point is that Paul makes here is to be of kindred spirit. Now, what does that really mean? It means that the two, they knew each other so well. How many of you, you can raise your hands, how many of you got a friend, or it could be anybody, but at least they're your friend, that like, can finish your sentences, right? Like a, hopefully, like more of us. You probably do, you're just not letting them finish, right? You, 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 maybe you talk a lot, you're like, oh, let me finish that sentence for you. But, or, you know, they know what you're thinking. They know by the look on your face, like, oh, man, I know what he's thinking right now, dude, right? I mean, we all, we all got probably somebody in our life that we've, we've done enough life with to know, like, man, we, you know, that person knows what I'm thinking. But be of kindred spirit, right? I can say from my personal example, remember, like, I think friendship is a good foundation. It's my spouse, my wife, Janae. Like, we, we, you know, being a parent is hard, yeah? You guys can amen to that all day long. Your kids are in here. They know they're difficult. My kids are in here going, yep, we're doing it. I see you shaking his head over there. Uh, like, being a parent is hard. And so sometimes my kids will go and they'll ask my wife, like, hey, can I do this? And she'll tell them no. What are they going to do? Who do they go ask next? They go ask dad, right? Like, dad, can I do this? And, they go, no. and like, man, mom just said that. Like, I'll, I'll, I won't say no, but I'm going to tell them why no. And they're like, oh, mom just said that, right? But, we, but I think that's a definitely a force to reckon with in marriage or being a parents together. But, you know, in life together as friends, as you go through things, to be able to finish each other's sentence or know what each other are thinking. Or you go and you talk to one person and you're like, man, you, you, you tell them this, or you give them advice, and they hear the same. There's nothing like hearing the same advice from multiple people, right? It doesn't, it, it's just crazy. Um, you know, I, I know my mom's in here too, so I'm just going to. But parents, like our, our parents, like an older generation, they always, they never want to take your advice as, your, as, as being their kids, right? They always want to listen to somebody on the news or, like, I, I read in the Wall Street Journal, it says this. We're like, man, we've been trying to tell you that for years. You know what I mean? Like, what, come on. <laughs> you know, like, why don't you listen to me? But they hear advice from multiple places, the same thing. And finally they go, oh, okay, now I'll listen. So b keep giving good advice. Hopefully they'll listen one of these days. And, and the same goes with, with your kids. I swear, my kids... They don't listen to anything I say, and I can't wait until they're like mid-20s, early 30s, where life goes, hey, man, like, oh, man, I remember you telling me that, Dad, back in the day, and I never listened. I should have listened to you. Like, what the greatest compliment a parent could get is your, your kids come up to go, I should have listened to you, and it'll never happen. I mean, <laughs> am I right? Anyways, all right, so let me move on, because I'm going to get caught in the weeds on that one. Uh, point two is genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Timothy was always thinking of others, right? Because like Tim, Timothy really was on mission. And, and, and so he was always thinking of others, thinking of their spiritual growth. How could they, you know, how could we ex, like see their, 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 help them see their blind spots so where they can grow past this or get past that certain situation so they can make a contribution, so they can join the church, so to grow in unity of faith, right? To, to grow up in Christ Jesus, right? And so Timothy was always genuinely concerned for their welfare and how they can move on. And, and, and a lot of times that was a sacrificial means for Timothy for others to serve others and I think that the greatest trait for 
Christianity, for Christians, and I always take this from biblical manhood, definitely, the greatest trait you could start with is humility. Yeah, I mean, Jesus was the model of humility for us. The greatest trait you can start with is humility. And I love this. It says here that uh, the sacrifice is the icing on the cake for humility. And that's just serving others, considering others' needs above yours, always wanting to serve them. And, and, and man, how many of you can enjoy somebody that has humility in your life? Right? Like, yeah, right? Like, you know, nobody wants a selfish person around all the time. Let's be honest here. Like, you're always looking to do something for yourself and not other people. Like, nobody wants that person in their life, and that's a hard person to have in your life. So humility is really the opposite of that. And it was interesting, I, uh, I was... Um, I was listening to something, and actually this point is further down, you know, being double-minded. How many of you ever heard double-minded? You've been in the church for a while. You know, double-minded is really the antithesis of humility, right? It's like almost the opposite, yeah? Like you're, you're, you're self-serving. You're always looking for yourself. And, and yeah, I jumped ahead, but um, again, it, it brings up the point that Timothy was of single mind, okay? Timothy was focused on the mission. Timothy always knew what the path was ahead. He was working with other people to know the path and keeping focus and not letting the world really bleed into that. And James 1, I love this. It speaks of a double-minded person, okay? And, and James 1 starts off with having this perseverance through trials and having faith in God through the hard times and, and asking God for wisdom. But he writes this. He says, one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That hurts. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So when you think of double-minded, I want you to think about this. Double-minded is essentially leaving yourself in out. When things get hard, you go, you know what? I have an escape route. I don't have to do that. I'm just going to go do this. And God's going to put you through some hard times in life, isn't he? He's going to go, man, I, I want you to go do this. I want you to go start this. I want you to go talk to this person. And you go, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to go over there. Like, oh, they, like, I don't want to go to my neighbor's house. They've, they've got, they just got a big angry dog and they're going to you know, bark and bite me or something, right? Like, it's, these excuses, which, okay, it's better to be safe, obviously. But there's certainly a way to reach your neighbor. Uh, I'm that neighbor that's just got the big angry dog. Um, but... <laughs> Um, but I want to say this, is that if you want to avoid being double-minded, the best practice is to take quit off the table. Okay, examine your no and think through if they are just excuses. Okay, perhaps a lack of faith or maybe you just don't feel like it. Man, who wrote that? Whew, that one hit home for me right there. Um, you know, the Bible says make your yes be yes and your no be no, right? Like make sure that you're saying, and, and when I think about that, I think about why am I saying yes? What's the mission? How am I going to say yes to this? And what am I sacrificing to say yes to this? Or why am I saying no to this? A lot of times our no's are because of excuses. We don't feel like it. Or maybe you don't see how you can make a contribution to that. I love that. That one's always challenged me. I've said no to things where I go, you know, I don't even know what I can do there, and I'm just not going to go. And then at one time, sometimes I, God put me to the test, and I've said yes, and I grew so much through that. Like, no, I don't want to go to that, that meeting. No, I don't want to read that book. It was crazy the way God used that to reach me and grow me into more. But here's a perfect example, and I don't know if a lot of you, a lot of you probably don't know this. Cross Church over at Surprise and, and, and Andrew, they, they get together and they map out these messages. If you go to the Cross Church Surprise campus, we're preaching on the same portion of scripture or the same topic, and they try to map out, you know, who's going to preach for at least, you know, eight months to 12 months out. And so let me tell you something. I was not on the schedule for this week, okay? I was not supposed to preach this week. That's why I had to pull the Andrew's shirt back out again. And some of you are like, wow, okay. Did you wash it? No, I didn't wash it. Did I wash it? I don't remember if I washed it or not. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, so I pulled the shirt out again. And, uh, you know, Andrew had texted me, though. Like, this is a few weeks ago. And he said, hey, do you want to preach this weekend? And this is, the, and, 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 and he, he didn't know this. But I had typed out a bunch of reasons why not to. I had, I had it all. And I stopped a second and I looked at it and I'm like, that's an excuse. That's an excuse. That's an excuse. I mean, I got a lot going on with work right now. I got a lot going on with life right now. You, to put a sermon together, 
takes a lot of hours for me just to come up here and run my mouth for 25, 30 minutes. Well, today's going to be three hours because Andrew's not here. But <laughs> I know he's probably watching. He's like, dude, stop. Uh, he's going to text me here in a minute. And anyways, but it takes a lot of effort, right? A lot of study, a lot of, you know, and, and it's effort that I like to do that you have to really enjoy doing and feel the call to do it. But I looked at all the excuses and I said, what am I doing? Why? And I deleted all of them and I said, send it. And if you ask him to pull up on his phone, he'll see it says send it. And he sent it, and here I am. And if you don't know, if you're not following where Andrew's at now, he's able to go to Hawaii with his wife and celebrate a little bit of peace before they bring some more life into the world. And I think that is beautiful, to be able to see those pictures that he puts up on Facebook and to be able just to, to, to him to be able to do that. It's just, it's amazing. So, uh, Andrew, I want to thank you for this opportunity to let me come up here and do that. But I hope you're enjoying Hawaii because I would love to be there too, <laughs> on the beach. So anyway, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, just think about being mission-focused and not being double-minded because I had a million ways out and all of them were just excuses. All of them were selfish. All of them were just me going, you know what? I need to focus on the mission because my job, my, even my family, is not as important as furthering the mission for Christ, right? And so if you call to do something and God's asking you to do that through one of his servants, you want to think about why you're saying no. All right, so I'm going to get off that horse. Uh, so, um, also, too, this is good. Uh, you know, Timothy was a servant, and he was always learning, right? Paul said he was like a child serving his father. Uh, you know, he's always, and, and I believe he's using the context here of he was always willing to learn, he was always listening, he was always contemplating conversations and maybe coming back for the follow-ups here and there, right? Like being around Paul, there's probably a lot to learn uh, just by going through there. But we can all do well, our lesson is that we, we can all do well to listen to others. Yeah, I mean, listening is becoming few and far between these days. With social media, everybody wants to just shout and put their point of view out there or find like-minded point of views where you get caught in this loop of just constantly thinking of the right thing because you found 10 or 15 other people thinking the right thing and you're never really examining it to go, man, or listening to the counter argument because feelings, yeah? There's a lot of feelings on what? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, there's a lot of feelings. And we would be well to just listen the counter examples listen to what other people are saying <laughs> it's interesting uh you know there's something to learn from everybody am i right like you could learn something by listening to an idiot let's just be honest here <laughs> i mean this person like oh, i can't I, I can't even listen to this person today but just listen to him and, and you might actually pick something up you might walk away still going you know what that person still an idiot i don't need them in my life but i learned something right young ones okay like i know maybe you got those kids at school that are always you know running their mouth or they're always getting in trouble maybe you should go and try to be friends with them and see their point of view and see what they're talking about um man there's nothing like engaging the bad i was one of the bad kids i was definitely one of the bad kids and man it was hard to make friends um well the right friends but you know and, and to listen to other point of views so young ones Donovan, I see you. You make friends with the kids that you think are bad or are unruly and listen to their point of view, and you'll see. Maybe you two will get together and change it. Maybe you'll learn something, right? Um, so uh, verse 24, you know, uh, Paul mentions that he's going to be coming shortly, and I like the way Paul's hope, he just keeps it alive, right? He doesn't really know what the future holds, and he, he puts it out there like, hey, I'm hoping in Jesus that I get to escape this, but... You know, I, I'm going to keep the hope, even though God's, you know, plan might have been a little different. So moving on, uh, you know, you got to be a friend to make a friend. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah, right. You got to be a friend. A lot of times we got to be a friend first. And this guy, Epaphroditus, he was definitely being a friend. And, and before we move on to verse 25, I want to give a little background here. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Paul was in prison, okay? He was held up against his will. Uh, you know, he was, he was able to write this, get this letter. Uh, but... The church, they found out that Paul was in prison, and they knew Paul. Paul was the guy who said, if a man wants to eat, he's got to work, right? How does that work? If a man is unwilling to work, he shall not eat. That's what he wrote in 2 Thessalonians. And so they knew, like, oh, man, he must need money now because here he is. He's tied up. He can't get out and work. He can't get out and do all the Paul things that he does. So let's send him some money. 
And, and, and historically, I found that there's people that think he was in three different prisons it, or three different locations. He was in a Roman prison, but he was in three different locations. And I think the closest one, the closest prison that Paul could have been in was about a thousand miles away. I'm thinking to myself, a thousand miles. Okay, you guys, like, there's no planes, there's no trains, there's no automobiles, there's no John Candy, there's no none of that, right? Okay? Does anybody get that? Like, am I just old? Are you back there? Yeah, all right. All right you know, selling the little, the, what, the shower rings, right, for earrings. Yeah, that, that was the best movie ever. Anyways, um, so there, like, he had to walk. Okay, I want just, I was still trying to wrap my head around this. Epaphroditus had a bunch of money to take to Paul to walk a thousand miles. Maybe he had some people with him, but it was probably wasn't the safest place, the safest journey to go, yeah? And so they got wind that, the, the, uh, somebody must have went back because during the journey, Epaphroditus got sick. So somebody must have went back to the church and told him that, right? And, and so um, it couldn't have been easy. Almost, like it was, says deathly ill, all right? Deathly. Like that's, that's pretty bad to be on that journey with money, fall deathly ill. All right? I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around carrying all that money. So like, that's, that's being a friend. So picking up at verse 25, but I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. Has anybody ever been accused of brother, soldier, worker, messenger, minister of need? You ever, you ever, you ever, anybody ever accused you of that? And your friends, like maybe someone was like, ah, oh, maybe brother, right? That's being a friend big time. Like, that's an awesome example of being a friend where he's like, ah, man, Paul's like, this, this guy's a soldier. Like, he's just willing to do for the mission, you know, and help further things. And he's just bringing me money to help me and my cause. That's awesome. So you can clearly see Epaphroditus was definitely dedicated Okay, to be able to make that journey. Maybe he was in good shape too. Maybe he got up early, Matt. You know what I mean? Got it worked out, right? It's all right, we'll, we'll get there. But maybe he got up, you know, he did a lot of push-ups and sit-ups and squats. Anyways, but to make that journey couldn't have been easy. But, but Paul felt it necessary to send him back. And you're probably thinking like I did. Okay, wait a minute. He just got here. He almost died getting here. And now you want to send him back? Because Paul was thinking of the greater good. Paul was thinking about godly fellowship. Paul wanted to get him back because he knew. You ever had a loved one or somebody in the hospital who, like, you're not really sure of the prognosis. You're not really sure of the outcome, right? Like, you're thinking this is it for him. Doesn't life kind of stop, right? Like, normally life just kind of goes on pause. And you're like, I'm, I, 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 you go to work, you kind of go through the motions, you get up in the morning, like, you're hard-pressed to even brush your teeth, right? Because you're really worried about that loved one. And you kind of let life's mission just kind of be on pause for a minute. And that was why Paul was in such a hurry to send him back because he knew that the church there at Philippi, they were doing some things, but they were probably more concerned about one of their own and going, hey, we, need to, we, we want to know about this guy and maybe they're missing out on the mission. All right, so um, verse 27, for indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and be less concerned about, I'm, excuse me, I may rejoice and be less concerned about you. As Paul saying, like, I don't want to worry about you. I don't want to worry about you forsaking the mission right now because you're worrying about Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus is an awesome guy, and God had mercy on him because he kept him here to keep the faith and to go on mission and to find more people to tell about Jesus, but he also on me because I don't want to have to deal with the loss and the hurt of losing somebody like that. Right? Like you see the way it all kind of works together. Like God uses all of us as the church. And when we're worried about one another, that kind of slows the mission down, doesn't it? And so we, we want to all pray for each other. We want us all to be healthy. We should all be getting up at 530. I'm just kidding. No, but, right. But, you know, we all want to be healthy together to be on mission. Yeah. So remember, think about that next time. And I mean, life's going to come. Right. We're all going to get sick. We're. We're all one day closer to death. Yeah, I mean, I know I am, and no matter how hard I try to hold it off, but man, but you, when you're mission-focused, you don't worry about that. You know God's got that taken care of, 
and you're focusing on doing the right thing and, and, and marching forward. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's the heart of discipleship. Uh, and a rejoice that I may be, it goes on to say, rejoice that I may be less concerned about you. Uh, and he, 29 says, receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold people like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to compensate for your absence in service of me. Man, he risked his life. And he wanted to get him back over there because he was doing some great things and they were doing awesome things. So don't just, you might have some friends in your life that you want to keep to yourself that are really good friends. Man, don't, that's, that's great, but share them. <laughs> if you got good friends in here, share them. Like, give them my, give them my number. You know, but yeah, but we all, we all need good friends and good people in our lives and we need to be in each other's lives. So what is our application in this if we haven't picked it up already? Kids, how are we doing on bingo? Are you missing anything? You it better not be a false bingo. All right. If you all got bingo over there, all right, good. And I don't need to try to hit any of these because I don't know if I got any jokes left. Um, I didn't give anybody a high five yet today. I got to do that. Yeah? You got a high five over there? All right. I see your, there, there's like a virtual high five. All right. So what's our application in here? Our application is we're the sum of all the people in our life, okay? But who are you surrounding yourself with? What are they doing? Are they doing the same things? Or have they done the same things but persevered through them? Think about that. You know, who are the people that you look up to and why aren't you trying to, you know, get involved with their life? Remember, misery loves company. And so if you're finding people all the time that are, want, that are doing the same maybe sinful things that you're doing, that's probably not a healthy group of people. I mean, I can tell you right now, I've been in those circles, right? I, they used to be down at the bar all the time on the weekends. Yeah, we were all doing the same things, and it was wrecking each other's lives. And I can't really call those people friends, because we were all just wrecking each other's lives. So, uh, two is, are you able to recognize the people God is sending into your life? The Bible tells us to test the spirits and to see if they are from God. Are you able to recognize this? These traits are probably a good starting point for you to be able to recognize people that are God sending into your life. Like humility is a huge one. If they're willing to serve and do and win, they want to do a lot for you, that's probably a good place to start as well. Um, but test the spirits, right? See if they're, they're from God. You know, and, and the last point is this. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I was in a meeting uh, earlier this week. And the, the, the leader had opened it up with, on a scale of 1 to 10, how loyal are you? How loyal are you? And I sat there and I was like, man, I have a million answers for that, but I don't know what the right answer would be. How loyal am I? Like, I don't even, I never even asked myself that. And then I happened to be studying, you know, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And I was like, well, how loyal would they have been? And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. They would have said 10, right? They would have said, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in, Paul. I'm, I'm all in on this mission. I don't, I don't, what do you mean how loyal am I? I, I can't imagine anything less. And I want to ask you, how loyal are you? I mean, think about this. Like, you know, maybe we have some relationships or maybe some things we're doing or maybe we're part of some ministry efforts here that we're not giving 100% of ourselves. And I got to ask you, why not? What are you reserving it for? What are you, what are you hanging on to it for? Uh, what, what's that Foo Fighters song, uh, who, somebody getting the best of you, right? Like, anybody? Yeah? No? Come on. I'm not that old. Y'all listen to Foo Fighters. Right? Yeah, but I see I got one back there. Anyways, who's getting the best of you, though? Who are you saving it for? Why don't you just throw it out there? And so I started really thinking about this, and I go, wait a minute. Let me find a place where Jesus gave about 80%. Let me try to find somewhere Jesus said, you know what? I'm not going to give all my effort to that. I'm just going to kind of, you know, just, just hang around. And I couldn't find anywhere. I couldn't find anywhere where Jesus did that in the years that he was on earth. So let me read Luke chapter 9 for you before we close. And uh, I think this is Jesus' way of saying, hey, I want all, 100% of you. Give 100% daily. Starting at verse 23, it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? That's all in. I don't know any other way to be all in. For the church, for the mission, for believers, non-believers, your neighbor with the angry dog. I believe that's what Jesus is calling us to do, is to be all the way up 100 all the time. Let's pray.